Hey guys, Jason here, and welcome back for part 2 of the TCG revamped retrospective. In the last installment, I talked about the philosophies that surrounded the project and how we view the game. This time, I'll be talking about the decks in more detail, specifically the roles they play in the ecosystem, how they've changed since our first deck profiles, and some other configurations not covered in the latest videos. We're going to be covering the decks from least changed to most changed, starting with... The Outlier. This is the fastest deck of our format. It fills the role of the traditional rush deck, employing very cheap creatures, and tries to close games quickly. Due to the simplicity of rush, this ended up being our most optimized and therefore least changed list. The only change is we replaced Solar Ray for Tulk the Oracle. We realized Solar Ray just wasn't that great of a card. We also figured this deck did have enough blocker hate in the form of the fire spells and Larba gear, so Solar Ray wasn't really needed. Meanwhile, Tulk being another one drop that can attack people really helped the deck a lot, so we are quite happy with how this turned out. Our second least change deck is Twin Cannon Turbo. This deck is a little gimmicky, but it is also our deck that most closely resembles the traditional mid-range deck. It's got the draw, it's got the board wipes, it's got the mana ramp, it's got the speed attackers. We really wanted to spotlight Twin Cannon, Sky Terror, and Essence Elf, and we weren't really feeling Bombazar Blue, so we felt that this was probably the best way to do it. We cut down from 50 cards, the old list actually did run 50 cards, and I think this does run a lot smoother. Obviously, it doesn't have some of the staple creatures like Bronze Arm and Aqua Hulkus, it doesn't have Soul Swap either, but I think if you removed some of the spells for those cards and you chucked in some Gauntas, you'd have a pretty solid Bombazar Blue, less Bombazar list. As we touched on in the deck profile, squeezing in a third T-Dad and a fourth Burst Shot would have been nice, but I think this is the compromise that we'll have to do. Some people really like Volcano Charger, so here's a list that uses Volcano Charger. The Burst Shots were removed for Volcano Charger, and then the Typhoons were replaced by Aqua Surfer. You obviously need those trigs so you don't fall apart, and you can also threaten the opponent. They can't just break you for free. I think, though, that because of how much Andrew loves the Emergency Typhoon T-Dad combo, the original configuration is the one that we're going to be sticking with. Another one of our fairly unchanged decks is Hydru's, which is interesting, because it had a bit of an identity crisis for a while. I found it hard to differentiate between this and Liquid People Beatdown in terms of what the deck brought to the table, so I wanted to try doing a slower version using Cranium Clamp. But then after testing, we felt this wasn't the best use for Hydru's, so we decided to keep it as an aggro deck, but add the gimmick of stealing an extra turn with Holy Awe. Because this deck is generally aggressive and yet well-balanced, it's typically what we first test against when trying out a new deck. The big change was obviously the addition of Holy Awe, which can force checkmate scenarios by buying an extra turn and then finishing the opponent with a speed attacker Hydru's. We also ditched Energy Stream and Illusionary Merfolk as the extra draw in favor of Lucky Ball. Stream, I can see coming back, because the deck can run out of steam if it doesn't hit Lucky Ball or Hulkus at the right timings, but I think Lucky Ball's draw effect is a lot easier to pull off than Illusionary Merfolk's, as sad as it is to say. I think that, um, you know, just being able to top deck Lucky Ball late game and draw some cards is just too powerful to ignore. Our Glass Mutant was another cut that was quite sad for me because I think it's a really interesting card. Andrew liked it a lot, but ultimately Damien and I outvoted him in favor of Windmill Mutant instead. The deck was originally built with 40 cards, and the original list was actually pretty solid, so outside of a major concept overhaul, not much could really change with this one. The next deck I want to talk about is the Worms deck. The meme deck of the lot, this deck was too beloved for us to drop. It runs even more destruction than before, but we also felt that despite this, and even if we did throw in extra blockers, aggro would still give this deck a hard time. So we carved a new role for it instead. It's somewhat competitive versus control, but more significantly, it works very well against decks that need to stick their creatures, like dragons and wave strikers, and we thought that was a really cool role for it. The main changes from before are obviously cutting down from 40 plus to 40 cards. We also cut a lot of the creatures and we play a lot more spells instead. Cranium Clamp, we would say, is the biggest game changer. Unfortunately, Shadow Moon had to go. I was quite sad about this because the card is quite, I, I guess, kind of unique. 
but it just dies too easily to board clears. I think if it was harder to remove, then it would be a lot better. Uh, but if you want to play a sort of Horrid Worm beatdown style deck, maybe you could try playing it with Petrova and some water for draw. The deck is quite slow, so I actually wanted to put in Nature, but Andrew shot that idea down pretty quickly. If you're wanting something a little more resilient to aggro, here's a list with some slight modifications. We squeezed in some three bloody Skeetos who can block. And here's our latest configuration with Photoside. Damien loves this card, and I think it is a pretty cool card. It's a very... It has a very unique role in the ecosystem in that it polices the field against boss monsters. 9k is absolutely massive, but more significantly, Photoside can also deal with Mysterious and Petrova, which can be quite problematic for this deck, or any deck for that matter. The other talking point that I wanted to discuss is Cloned Nightmare. I think the card is very good, and it does fit pretty well with this deck. I'm just not too sure what I would cut, perhaps Ghost Touch, but there is merit to having two drops in my opinion, especially in a deck that can't really deal with multiple creatures at once. Anyway, I think this latest configuration is great, and I think it is also very consistent with our vision for the deck. Yeah, we take the L to aggro, but it continues to act in the thorn of the side of control decks, and of course the decks that want to stick multiple creatures. Speaking of control decks, the next deck we're going to talk about is Foul Control. Kind of like the jank deck of the format, but hey, we like it. The reason I call it that is because it lets these very strange cards shine, like Dark Reversal, Logic Cube, and Flood Valve. In our group, some of us, Andrew especially, loved the idea of running lots of one ofs and the traditional foul control was just a great way to highlight that concept. Compared to the original version, we of course cut down from 50 to 40 cards, and because we introduced new things like Cranium Clamp, some of the old cards had to go. So if you'll notice, cards like Aquahulkus and Locomotiver, which are typically mainstays in control decks, are no longer present. If you remember the more recent deck profile, you'll also notice that this list is slightly different. We made a couple of changes, but they are very important changes. So we took out Gatling Sky Terror. Yeah, that was a bit heartbreaking. We really wanted to make him work, but he's just too clunky. We took out Crystal Memory and one copy of Magris and Coral each for a Miraculous Meltdown, one Pyro, the second Searing Wave, and Bulmedius. These changes just made the deck so much more solid. Miraculous Meltdown especially fits the deck perfectly, given how slow it is, and I also like how this new configuration gives this deck a selection of toolbox finishers between your dragons and Meltdown Pyro. I feel like it just is so thematically consistent with our vision for the deck. And it also makes it better. Another cool thing I should mention is how the deck now has equal Civ representation at 11 each, perfectly balanced as all things should be. The last talking point I have for this deck is a bit of a funny one, and it's about the second Searing Wave. Originally, we had it in because it's another board clear, and it is also the fastest board clear, and this deck is quite slow. But a funny application is if the opponent is trying to actively play around Miraculous Meltdown, you can actually use Searing Wave to pop your last shield and then give him the old Meltdown Pyro. Something about that is just so hilarious to me. And the last deck we're going to cover for this video is another control deck. It is the most changed out of the least changed decks. It's Bulmedius, otherwise known as Rub Control. This is the more typical control deck. The strategy is a little clearer than Fowl's, and it feels less toolboxy. It attempts to gain the best possible matchup spread by building around high utility cards. I'd say the deck trades versatility for consistency in that Fal can probably deal with more situations or matchups, but this deck is a lot more consistent. Again, we cut down from 50 to 40 cards. The biggest changes were the removal of the Cyberlord engine and the Searing Waves. Instead, it's packed with a bunch of chargers thanks DM plays and Blizzard of Spears. I like the ramp a lot, with all the chargers, hitting Lost Soul on 6 or 7 is really consistent, and they make Apocalypse Vice a lot more accessible as well. And of course, because Blizzard costs 6, hitting a charger on 4 is quite common, meaning Blizzard is oftentimes coming out at the same time as Searing Wave under the previous configuration. 
Surprisingly, I don't miss Emerald that much. This deck does have 8 Trigs, but I think Terra Pit is the only amazing target, and the deck only runs 3. Ramping into board clears is how the deck deals with everything anyway, aggro included. Meltdown and Pyro are obviously great fits for the deck, so here's a configuration that uses them. The deck also has Thrash Crawler and Corpse Charger to support the combo, but I think this makes the win conditions too similar to Foul Control, and Galk Life is pretty cool anyway. All in all though, it's a control deck, there are a bajillion ways to tinker with the counts, and upheaval has even been mentioned to me in the past, but right now we're happy with our list and what it does in the ecosystem. And that concludes part 2 of the TCG revamped retrospective. We've introduced some setups and win conditions to the old favorites, but outside of some streamlining, they by and large operate the same way. In the next episode, we're going to cover the decks that went through the most changes, but until then, Thank you guys so much for watching, stay safe, and we'll see you guys next time.